Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education, part one, and this is session five. Uh, I, I almost wish I had talked to you folks about this off of the tape, but I'll just go ahead and say this. Man, I tell you what, uh, have you been reading the notes? I hope that you've been going over the notes. But I'm going to tell you, I think the work that we're going to do today, I'm very excited about what we're going to do, and I think this will maybe clear up any last vestiges of uncertainty about this. So uh, I guess the thing to do is just get right into it. So here we are. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And um, we've identified all of the things up to that point. Beseech is to urgently ask. The therefore takes you back to those things that were just said uh, previously. The brethren uh, are those like-minded saints who are uh, uh, on the same page as Paul with regard to this uh, area of their sonship. By the mercies of God, that was the components of your new identity in Christ. I'm not saying anything that we haven't already covered. I'm just kind of reminding you of that. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And we're putting some things on the board. But I want to talk about this living sacrifice because, and this is what I started to say off the camera, I don't know how many different ways I worked through this passage. Um, but I, I, the, the only thing I can do is say it like this. this. This particular terminology has not been used up to this point in the book of Romans. It's the first time we've seen that terminology, a living sacrifice. Now, I'm thinking then either Paul has to explain it here, or there has to be something that's sitting back before that would give me a clue as to what this is. And because of the mercies of God, because of those mercies, let me just, because of the mercies of God, which are the, com the, the components of our justification, and especially, because this is the context, our sanctification. In other words, that's the means by which this is going to be done. So I'm just going to call this our new identity in Christ, all right? Now, and I went back to that, and because I was doing that, and, and looking at that, let, well, look, let me say it like this, and I'll just put it up here because we're going to come back to this over and over. There's those, those three issues that are right there in that verse. So I thought to myself, because of what a sacrifice is, because of what that brings into your thinking, what has been said before... Uh, uh, by the way, by the way, let me just back this up a little bit. Because all of this is in reference to your body. Present your bodies, right? And here was the tendency. The tendency was the more I got back into that and tried to, you know, put that together, the more it got away from what was happening, what I'm supposed to do with my body, and it got more into other areas. And I kept coming back and saying, okay, I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice. And then suddenly it hit me. So I'm trying to kind of talk you through this process of, of how I got there. But one, one last thing, that therefore, I beseech you therefore, which you know means that we've just come out of something pertaining to the dispensational change. So it's in view of that dispensational change. That was the other thing. You have to keep that in mind. And you have to keep in mind that this is a way that you're presenting your body. Now, this may not seem near as complicated to you as I'm saying it right now, but I was just trying to keep all of that in the frame. And then I got to thinking, there, there is something here that I should be looking at in which that terminology makes perfect sense. 
And I think I see that. That's one of the things I want to be explaining to you today. But let me just say that in, by saying present your body as a living sacrifice, here's what you're doing. You are making a decision. As a matter of fact, what kind of decision could we call this? Thank you. We're making a sonship decision to do something here, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And that decision is a huge decision. And the reason that it is, is because our bodies are not redeemed, right? And because our bodies are not redeemed, you have to say, for what purpose then are we going to present them unto God? I mean, we're going to present them in a particular way. I'm not trying to leave out the living sacrifice part, but why are we doing that? And the reason is because God has a purpose that He means to accomplish when we do that. And this is a very important purpose to Him. I'm going to tell you exactly what that is. But we're volunteering, and by the way, that's connected, that purpose is connected to His glory. So He wants to do something with our unredeemed bodies that brings Him glory. Also, these bodies have sin still dwelling in their members. And that's because they weren't redeemed. They didn't get purged out. And so even though God did some things to free us up from that old relationship that we had with sin in our bodies, I mean, we're, we still have that. So what do you do? You, you're you're going to live out of that new identity in Christ. Remember we talked about that before. You're going to live out of that new identity in Christ and that is not going to be living after the flesh, but that's going to be after the Spirit. The things the Spirit did when He baptized you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and identified you with each one of those things. This is, because it's the dispensation of grace, the therefore, here's how I tied that in. I just, I just should have put this on the PowerPoint because what I'm, I'm af here's what I'm afraid of. I'm about to give you a big long sentence and I don't want you to get lost in the midst of it. So let me see if I can say this more concisely. I beseech you, therefore, which you know means something I've just talked to you about, which is what God is doing in this dispensation of grace. So, when we are asked to present our body as a living sacrifice, it's in connection with something God is doing in this dispensation of grace. Everybody with me so far? And what God is doing in this dispensation of grace is different than He did in the dispensation of the law when Israel's program was in effect. So, this, this living sacrifice. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of struggling with this. Because our body is what's in view, you tell me. Just, just think with me for a moment. What have you already been told about your body by Paul? Huh? Oh, 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 okay, you know what? I was sitting in the office with Billy and I was talking through this thing. I said, I want to make sure this makes sense. She said the exact same word. And so I'm going to tell you what I told her. It is corruptible. There's a phrase the Bible uses to describe that. Lengthen that out a little bit and give me the phrase the Bible uses. It has that word in it. <coughs> Do you remember? Corruption. Yeah. We're under the body of corruption. I'm sorry, what did I say? Body? I'm sorry. The bondage of corruption. I just created a new doctrine. The body of corruption. We're under the bondage of corruption. What else do you know about our body? It's weak. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth, but we're groaning for something else. 
We're groaning for the redemption of this body, right? Because we're going to get a new body that's going to function out in the creature. Well, you, you're hitting it right on the head here. This is exactly where I wanted to go. Let me just put up on the PowerPoint the things that I want you to see about this. Now, granted, I've included a couple of extra things that aren't specifically about the body, but, I, but you'll see as we go here. First of all, here's what we already know about our bodies. That they're going to encounter some suffering, right? What is that first kind of suffering we were told about? Yes, the sufferings of this present time. And you know what that is? That's because you live in a fallen world and it's just the things that happen. So that suffering is going to qualify us to be joint heirs. I know that's not specifically about our body, but the next one is. So we know this body will go through the sufferings of this present time. And we know that God is not going to intervene in that, right? Here's the next thing we know. We know those sufferings, by the way, this isn't about the body, but I'm just saying it, that those sufferings cannot be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In other words, we're not going to go through them for nothing. Here's the next part. We know that our bodies are under the bondage of corruption. And they are. That means from time to time you will get sick. Don't hug Linda today. That means from time to time, uh, you may be injured in some kind of an accident. You fall off a ladder, something happens. It means that as you get older, your body doesn't function as well as it did when you were younger. That's all part of the bondage of corruption. Here's the next one. Because of that bondage of corruption, we groan for the redemption of our bodies. We're looking for the... And by the way, the older you get, the more you groan for that. And... Huh? Every morning. <laughs> I tell you when I do it, I don't just do it in the mornings anymore, but when we take a long trip in the car, as soon as I stand up out of that car, oh, I am groaning for the redemption of my body. <laughs> I don't know, I get stiff now. I used to never did that. Wow. No, the car seats don't help. So, I have, I have another one here. That redemption of our body, that, that is our hope, and we are to patiently wait for it. Remember when we covered this? And then, here's the last thing. We know that our bodies will also suffer under the attack of the adversary. Remember that list? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril? Or Remember... Those things up there are, are things against your body. So we know that the body is going to come under the sufferings of this present time and also the sufferings of Christ. Now, although we haven't encountered that phrase yet, the sufferings of Christ, that's what those are going to be told. Later we'll be told that's what those are. Those are the attacks of the adversary. So it's a different kind of suffering. Now, that, when I thought to myself, when I thought, what have I been told about my body? Those are the things that came to my mind. That I know my body is going to go through these things. My body is under the bondage of corruption, and it's got a couple of different kinds of sufferings that it's going to go un under. And now, if I'm supposed to present my body a living sacrifice, I want to talk about that living part for just a moment. Now look at this. The living part, I kept looking at that and I realized that this sacrifice, if it's a living sacrifice, it means this is going to happen every single day. I w I, as I was thinking about this, you know, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, and I do it with Billy till I wear her out and she goes away. And then I... I call one of my friends on the phone, I'm going, okay, listen to this, listen to this, let me, and let's just talk through this. And I'm doing this thing, and I'm talking through it, and I'm actually talking to a guy named Sonny Primo. I think you've ever met Sonny, unless you've been up there. You know him from Facebook, probably. So I call Sonny, and I go, Sonny, now just listen to this and tell me yeah, any holes in this. And, so, and I go, it's a living sacrifice because it's going to happen every day. As you're li this is how you're going to live every day. And he goes, yeah, because this is really good. He said, if it was a dead sacrifice, it just happened once. 
I thought, well, yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm giving Sonny his props here, okay? So there it is. Okay, you're not getting anything else, Sonny. Okay. But it's a living sacrifice, which means this is the disposition that you're going to be in now from this point forward. Does that, that make sense? And I got to thinking about it. Doesn't that living sacrifice, doesn't that kind of describe what we're talking about here with regard to what our body is going through? And when you present, this is what I'm understanding about this, when you present your body a living sacrifice, you're understanding that these things are going to happen to me and my heavenly Father knows they're going to happen and He's not going to short-circuit them. Now, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a couple of questions that come up here and I'll answer them in just a moment. But what, what we're saying is, we're, by presenting your body for this, you're saying this, I understand what it is you're doing by doing this, I understand what it means to you, and I understand what it means to me, and I'm good with that. It's kind of like that cry of Abba Father. It's saying, yes, I want to be educated. And now, before you enter that education, your father is nailing some things down with you to make sure that the answer is still yes. And so he's saying, you do understand that if you're going to go through this, this is the way it's going to be for you. It's going to be a living sacrifice. And you're going to have to say, yeah, I'm on board. I get it. So as I looked at that, and then some other things kind of began to, to fall into place for me here. So that means if it's a living sacrifice, if it's a living sacrifice, that's the way we're going to conduct ourselves, isn't it? So when those things happen, we have to remind ourselves, this is an opportunity to accelerate my sonship. Because God's not so interested in what's happening to the outer man as He is interested in what's happening to the inner man. And, the, and, and here, and look, I know, this is, I know you'll understand this, but it sounds odd, the more things that happen to your outer man give opportunity for the increase of your inner man. And I thought I actually had that as the last thing on this list, but I guess, but I, guess I don't. But it's going to be on another list then. I was just kind of not remembering there. Now, here's what you have to understand. Because God has done it this way. And why do I go back to this? Why do I go back to this? Because those are things that are happening to your body. And to me, that really does simulate what being a living sacrifice is about. To me, that makes, that, that connects up right there. So, we understand that when those things happen to our body, God did not overlook Something like, oh my goodness, that's happening to them. I didn't realize that was going to happen. He didn't overlook it. And it's not that they're happening to us because He's angry with us. A lot of people teach that. Something bad's happening to you. You know what? Linda would say, good thing she's going to church here. If she'd been going to church at the Assembly of God, you know what? There'd be sin in her life. Or she wouldn't have enough faith to be healed. Or maybe you're under a generational curse. Who knows? You know, I mean, you know what you're saying. I don't want to say that. Your mom's right up here. Okay. But I'm just saying. You know, you've heard those things, right? Well, what I'm saying is, that's not what it's about. You know that. God's not angry with us. In fact, He's not powerless. And the reason I bring that up is because what He is doing by not intervening is demonstrating the greatest power He possesses. It's not that he's not demonstrating his power. He's demonstrating his greatest power by doing it this. Because he is going to give us the grace to endure those sufferings and afflictions unto his glory. Not, I'm going to grip my teeth and complain about this, but I'm actually going to be able to go through this 
to the glory of my Father and put the power of His grace that's working in me on display to all creation. And everybody's going to see it. And that's what He wants done. That's the reason. Because there would be a simple way, there would be a simple way to alleviate all of this, and that would have been to have given us a glorified body the moment we trust in Christ. But why wouldn't He do that? Why not give us that non, I mean that body that would never get sick and never grow old and never get wounded and never be tired and why not give us that body the moment, I mean he did everything else didn't he? He saved your soul and your spirit, why not redeem that body? Tell me. Because if he does that, there is no vehicle to put this power on display in. Remember what Paul said? It's when I'm weak, he is strong. Remember? It's, it's in the things I can't do that his power is made manifest. And that's what he wants to do. So what's he doing it in? What's the part he's doing it in? He's doing it in the weakest part of you, this mortal, fleshly body that's heir to all of these things. And that's why He doesn't give you a, a body. Now, we're going to talk, I'm going to go take care of that a little further in just a moment. <coughs> but here's the statement I wanted to make, and I should have highlighted it in your notes. But I have a paragraph in there where I explain that leaving us in these unredeemed bodies is the way God designed for this to happen. And then the last sentence in that paragraph says this, This is all part of His wise plan for what happens to our bodies benefits our inner man. That, that is the key. Now when I make that statement, when I wrote that down, I immediately wondered, do the people, not, not you so much, but the people that will hear that statement, do they really understand how that works? How do the things that happen to our body benefit our inner man? <clears throat> and so I thought maybe I should do a little bit of an explanation about that. And the quickest way to sum it up is to say it this way. When we respond rightly to the sufferings that we go through. That is the power of God's grace at work in our life that is shown, like I said a moment ago, to the whole creation. And, 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 and that's important because not everyone can do that. Only God can do that. That's a power that Satan doesn't possess. And, and, by, and by the way, only a son really can understand that. That what the reason God's not doing this is because he's doing something greater. Now I'm going to take you to a verse in Hebrews. Now remember, Hebrews is written to the believing remnant who are out in the day of wrath. And while they're out there, they're going to be treated as sons. Remember, they're going to be, get the benefits of the new covenant. And while God is dealing with them, He's going to talk to them about something in this area of suffering. Now, I know it's in Hebrews. So you would normally think, well, wait a minute, we're just in Romans. Why are we jumping ahead to Hebrews? Because what Hebrews is doing is talking about something that happened back in the Gospels. So actually, we could look back in the Gospels and see this. The Hebrew writer is putting it in a nutshell, so I think it's just easy to look at it there. But it is something that's behind us. So anyway, here's the verse. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Though he were a son, and he was talking about Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect... Now, he's not talking about, oh, Jesus became, a, you know, perfection. It's talking about being made perfect in what way? Uh, okay, it's through those sufferings, but what, how were they perfecting him? 
in his sonship life, right? They're bringing him, okay, and he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. In other words, the reason Jesus was able to do what he was supposed to do is because he became that which he should have become, and that all happened because of the sufferings. Those sufferings, my point is this, they benefited Jesus. If they would benefit him, it, then we know that Paul is going to be saying the same kinds of thing to us. Hebrews is saying the same thing to the believing remnant. That's the reason he's telling them. He's not just telling them a story. He's saying the things that you're going through are going to be for your benefit. The things that the Son of God went through were for His benefit as a son. And for us, the things that we go through are going to be for our benefit. That's the point that I'm trying to get to here. And so, those sufferings... Now, if you say, okay, they're going to benefit us... Um, how do the sufferings benefit us? Somebody give me a way. Huh? Ooh, that's very good. They perfect the skills that we're going to learn. They allow us to sharpen those and become more. And, and why is that important? Because not only we use them here. Yeah, okay, practice makes perfect. We're... We're going to utilize those skills here in our everyday life. Where else are we going to use those? That's right, in the heavenly places. So here's what we have. We have a benefit then. The things that happen to our body work to our benefit. One, eternally, and they work to our benefit now. They not only have the idea because... As you go through the... Remember, what is it you're going to... If you suffer with Him, you are now part of what? Joint heirs. If you're a joint heir, that's an eternal benefit, isn't it? But is there any benefit to you now? You're, you're, uh, the first thing you mentioned, you're going to sharpen those sonship skills. Uh, look, I... I, I, don't, I don't think I put it on the PowerPoint. Let me just look. No, I didn't. So let me just go through it because they're here in your notes. First of all, those sufferings make us more than conquerors. You know what that means? They work to do the very opposite of what they were thought to do. Those sufferings now do not discourage us. Those sufferings now turn around and make us more. They, they do something to benefit us. Not only that... But those, those sufferings sharpen our skills. That's the one that Karen mentioned a moment ago. Through the endurance of those sufferings, His grace is at work in our life. Can you think about what a privilege that is? To know that God's grace is being manifested in us. Not only that, but through the sufferings, we are being perfected. See, just as, he was made, as Jesus was made perfect... We are being, remember, I know it's way over there, but remember he says he talks about being brought unto a perfect man. He's, that's what he's talking about, moving you along so that you get to that place. And then the last thing there is what happens to our bodies accelerates our sonship because you go through those things. Your part, now I'm going to, I know I kind of outlined a thing here in my notes that I was going to put up on the board. I just want to see where I am when I get to that. I thought I... Oh, wow. That's on over there. All right. I'm just anxious. There's a deal I want to put on the board for... I'll do it anyway. Fine. You're uh, presenting your body a living sacrifice. And that means that you're going to be given grace to endure. Yes? And when those things happen to you, when those things happen to your body, what are you supposed to do? 
Not complain. You because remember those because of who you have been made to be. You understand. You're not going. Well, that really started us off on the right foot. Oh God, why is this happening to me? None of that, right? Also, are you going to be going, now God, I need you to bail me out of this. You can't do that one. What you're looking at is, there is something that reflects your glory that's being done in me, and that is a much bigger issue than me being well right now. That is a bit... In fact... The worst thing that happens to you, the more that is manifested to His glory, and that becomes a very big issue. And because you understand that, because you know that, and you're not fighting against that, but you understand it's not just giving glory to your Father, but it is also benefiting your inner man because you're really learning how to handle these things better and better. Yeah, in the first you know but it's kind of unwieldy. You know, it's kind of like the first time you get on a bike. But after a while, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And you begin to handle this in your life that way, and that grace to endure gets put on display, but all of that stems from, I'm trying to lead you to, to, to a word, all that stems from <coughs> is, is where? <laughs> from where? Huh? Huh? It, it is your inner man, but I mean, what, what have you, what are you, when that's happening to you, what do you have to do to get there? Uh, I'm trying to say it without saying the word, and I don't know how to do that. Oh, believe, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to think about what this is, don't you? I mean, it's not so much what you're doing, it's, what, it's how you're thinking about it, right? See, now I, this is why I was excited to tell you about this. Because I think, I see something here. Look. Godly thinking. You're thinking about this suffering the way your father is thinking about it. You're thinking about being a living sacrifice every day this is how you live this is how it's going to happen now you can now see before i know what i did in living sacrifice i took you back to the mercies of god i took you back to dead to sin alive unto god being a, I took you back to all of that look i don't want to look you, i'm not looking at 12:1 let me see what the next verse is no that just almost seems redundant, doesn't it? I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, our new identity, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, and if we make that the things of our new identity, you've just been redundant, haven't you? You're not following that, are you? I'm looking at your faces now, and I see. Let me just back it up. That's right. Those are the things that are grinding away. The polishing, all of that is taking place. All right? So, in my, what I, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just refine what I told you earlier. Before, I hooked this living sacrifice up to the components of our new identity in Christ. Specifically to our sanctification. Being dead to sin, alive unto God, and being sons. But if you do that... That's what the mercies of God are. I don't think he's saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by, the, by your new identity in Christ, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then I say, how do you do that? By putting your new identity to, in Christ into effect. Well, wait a minute then. I've just said it twice in a row, haven't it? Well, it is important, but I mean, I don't think that's correct, though. I mean, why would I say that twice in a row? I beseech you by your new identity that you live out of your new identity. <laughs> See? Inst instead of doing, okay, okay. 
So here's what I'm looking at. I'm thinking, okay, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, your new identity in Christ, that you do what? That you present your body, and this makes sense to me. Let me just do the commitment. I've, I've gone to it twice and backed up each time, so here we are. Father, I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice unto you in cooperation with what you are doing in this dispensation of grace, which is allowing the power of your grace to be put on display in my body to endure the sufferings unto your glory. Does that make sense? It is long. And I didn't know how to shorten that up. I, but you should have... You know what? It's like, you know what? Everything else already belongs to him, doesn't it? And this thing is not redeemed. He goes, that's the thing I can show my power in. And you know what we're saying is? Then you know what? I give it up. There you go. There you go. There you go. In fact, this is the way I wrote it on the board, at the whiteboard at my house first. Give it up. But you know what? And that's true. We're going to talk about that. Because even if you don't present your body, all of the sufferings are still going to happen. You're not, that's right. You're not, see, and that was one of the, I said there's a couple of questions that rise up that I want to deal with that. And one of them is the idea, if someone has the idea, well, I'm not presenting my body because I don't want that stuff happening. I got news for you. It's happening anyway. Just get old. You'll find out. Right? Old er, sorry, nobody in here is old yet. Okay, <laughs> old er, er. Okay, so that's the point. You're you can't stave that off. In your notes, I said it like this: You're not going to enjoy perfect health because you don't present your body a living sacrifice. That's why I use the word cooperate. You're just co-op because the therefore, remember, takes you back to the dispensation of grace. I'm saying, Father, I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice in cooperation with what that therefore was about. That what you're doing in this dispensation of grace. Because I understand what you're doing is, I'm going to be doing some suffering. And you're going to allow it. But you're allowing it because there's an eternal benefit to me, there's a present benefit to me, and there's a benefit to you. No, no, he's not hanging you out to dry. Oh, and, and you know what? Okay, okay. Look, 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 look. You're, you're, you're killing me here. You're teaching my lesson. No, look. No, no, no. Look, look, look. look. You know what? I'm dying to put this on the board. So can I just put it up there? Because we're almost done with this lesson. Let me just put it up there, and as we work through this, I want you to see this. Look, holy, can I just wind you back a little bit? What were you ever told about, because this is still about, see, I had to put this up here this way. In fact, in my, at home on the board, I put body one, body two, body three. Three ways that we're, the body is being dealt with here in, in Romans 12, 1. I gotta, let me see if I can get it. Look, this holy aspect, you see that? What were you told before by Paul about your body and the aspect of holiness? I, I know this is kind of, you know, now I'm just, you know, can you just recall a verse? But let me just put these verses up. Romans 6.13 Neither yield ye your members, the members of what? Your body. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteous unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members. See, he's not just talking about you now, but he's also talking about your body. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So what happens when we yield? What does yield mean? It means to give way to someone else, right? So if you give, by the way, this is talking about your body. So in a sense, isn't the saying when he says yield your members, isn't he saying give those members over to be used by your father for purposes of righteousness rather than purposes of unrighteousness? Okay, so look at this next verse. 
6.19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' service to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. And he repeats that same thing down in verse 23 of that chapter. Righteousness unto holiness. And how do you get that? By yielding... Your members, right? Now look, that's the holiness aspect, right? I'm going to yield my members. So doesn't that make sense that that be a way to present your body to the Lord? To say, you know what? I'm going to give my body. Not only am I allowing this body to be a, a sacrifice, I am allowing this body to be used by you, Father, to do what you want to do. And guess what that is? Guess what that is? Huh? Do you see a pattern developing here? I'm not, now again, I want to do the I would do all the work on it, but I just want to fill it in before we get through with this session. How is your oh I should have done this in a different order. I asked myself the question. When is my body going to be a living sacrifice? That's how I got into that. When is my body going to be a living sacrifice? How can that be? Well, you know what? I'm thinking it's a living sacrifice unto God when I cooperate with what's going on with that suffering that it's going to endure. When is my body going to be holy? My body's not going to be holy until I yield my members unto righteousness. In other words, then I start doing the things like I've been made to be. I'm the son that I am. Then I said, who, who, and here's this last one. Remember that last one, holy and then acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. When is my body going to be acceptable? Because I thought, you know what, and it's just plain old ordinary condition. It is anything but acceptable. And I got to thinking, can I do anything to make my body? And by the way, your body really isn't holy. It's producing a fruit unto holiness. Because this unredeemed body in and of itself is not holy in its essence. But God can use it to produce something unto holiness. And does that bring Him glory? Yes, because that's something no one else can do. Only God has the power to do that. And so then I thought, and this body acceptable, now we'll talk about what acceptable means because it, it really means worthy to be offered. But when you're talking about it's acceptable unto God, I thought, how is this body going to be acceptable unto God? And of course you think about that and you say, I can't do that. I can't do any of it, right? Isn't that what you were saying a while ago? We can't do any of this. Who has to do this? What did you say? The Spirit. Oh, that is excellent. I was afraid you were going to say God was going to do it, and I was going to have to ask you what member of the Godhead. You narrowed it right down. So the Spirit is going to do something. Does anybody remember? Oh, I know this is not going to be the next verse. I just know it can't be. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I have to stop right there. Look, I just, just to put it up, look. Do you remember where he talked about Minding the things of the flesh and minding the things of the spirit. And he talked about being spiritually minded. And that being, minding the things of the spirit was thinking about the things that the spirit did when he baptized you into de Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and made you that new creature. We talked about all that. When you do that, when you do that, the spirit dwells in you. And when he, that means he's doing something. It doesn't just mean he's taking up residence. It means he's doing something there. And when he dwells in you, does anybody remember what the Spirit does? Oh, yes! He quickens your mortal body. Why does it call it your mortal body? Because he's showing you it's in, still in this unredeemed body that is corruptible. He is quickening it. 
And quickening is more than being made alive. What is quicken? Come on, we're on a roll. <laughs> it means to rouse to fullness of function. R remember that? And not, not, look, a guy can be alive, but he may not be fully functioning. Big difference. To be quickened is to say, this thing is doing the maximum thing that could be done. And God has roused it to fullness. Of, and it says, by, and it we'll get to the verse, but it talks about that he, the, he quickens these mortal bodies by His Spirit. And, and that, is all, that is all in direct connection to us minding the things of the Spirit. So when we get over there, you know what we're going to look at? You mind the things of the Spirit, and when you do, the Spirit quickens your mortal body, and guess what that is? Yes! That is godly labor. You are laboring with your Father because He's doing this one too, isn't He? Now, am I stretching the point here? I mean, when I looked at, when that started coming together, I thought, wow! Look at that! This, this looks like this is how this works. I mean, I really, so I started really combing through this. And I looked at it and I thought, you know what? This is how we're thinking about we're presenting our body this way. And this is what we're doing when we're yielding our members, okay, unto, uh, unto righteousness. And this, and doesn't it make sense that God looks at that and He says, okay, you're enduring those sufferings to my glory? That's a living sacrifice. You're presenting that body holy. That's because you're yielding those members. And out of that new identity in Christ, that's what exactly was able to be produced. And if God says, and that body is acceptable when you and I are laboring together to do something you could never do on your own. Now, maybe I'm just pulling at strings. But I really see how this works. Okay, I, my deal went off. Okay, we, we, we need to, we need to, I need to, I need you to see this the way I see it so you can at least understand what's going on here. Uh, look, there's not an element that we're going to leave out of this. Everything that's sitting back there is going to show up in this. Maybe I'm seeing it show up in a different part of the verse than someone else is. But we're not leaving anything out by looking at it like this. And I don't think we're, I know we're not overlooking anything. But I really see, a because you know what these do? These all come back to what we're doing with our body. And that's what Romans 12, 1 is talking about. Presenting our bodies. Okay, cut me off here, Bob.